Well, welcome everyone to our monthly conversation on racial healing and reconciliation. Uh, we have our uh, a guest tonight, Al Barlow. Uh, these sessions are sponsored by the Jacksonville Urban League and its Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. I'm the director of the center, Dennis Stone, and we're pleased to have all of you here and those of you who will be watching the recording going forward. I want to thank um, uh, Jamie Krasnigor, Julie Miller, and uh, Sophia Berger for their assistance in uh, making meetings like this happen. Um, and I also welcome Tammy Hodo, who's just joining, uh, who has been an uh, active supporter. And in fact, we're working together on a second annual conference on ra uh, racial healing and reconciliation. And she may be able to talk about that towards the end of the program. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce um, Al Barlow, a longtime attorney in Jacksonville, born and raised in Jacksonville, uh, has a fascinating history to share. We're so grateful he's taken time out of his schedule. He actually had to drive up from Miami today, and here he is with us. Um, looking as fresh as ever. So, um, Al, please take it away. Well, first of all, thank you for this blessed opportunity to uh, come and participate. I just found out about this when you all consulted with me to uh, invite me to come. So I've watched a couple of them. They were very informative. Um, and I was asked to just tell a little bit about myself. I was, um, and by the way, I'm gonna title my topic just for organizational purposes. And I know we're talking about racial healing and reconciliation, but I want to title this from the cradle to the casket. Racism and prejudice are baked into the American psyche. From, from cradle to casket, racism and prejudice are baked into the American psyche. Um, and I'm just going to uh, give you a little bit about my background first and then I'll go into some you know, life experiences. Um, I was born in a separate but equal hospital here in 1961. It was called Brewster. Uh, a lot of African-Americans who are older, probably than 40 or 50 or so, they know about that hospital. Uh, it was a separate but equal, really unequal hospital. And I was born there. So from the cradle, like I said, you know, from the, from the cradle to the casket. So I was born in a separate but equal hospital, which was really unequal because the facilities were not, you know, up to par with the other facilities. Then I went to uh, my mother's daycare. She ran a daycare for 40 years. I went there. It was predominantly um, African-American, although we did have two white students who went to the school. So that was my first introduction to a whites when I was in kindergarten at my mother's daycare, which is on the, which was on the north side of town, um, Edgewood area. That's the kind of, you know, the area most people know about. Um, and I went to Carter G. Woodson Elementary School in the 60s, and I was there in the sixth grade when integration came into effect. So I was in predominantly um, all African-American schools until they bust whites in to us at Carter G. Woodson Elementary. And so it changed the dynamic of schools, of the school immediately. Um, and I'm gonna come back to what happened to me in, in the third grade or the second grade before that, but anyway, uh, when they bust in white students, it changed the dynamic. And I found myself having to protect white students from some of my friends who just wanted to beat them up for no reason whatsoever. So one of the first experiences I had was protecting uh, a minority of whites from a majority of blacks in my elementary school. Uh, went to Northwestern Junior High at the time. It was predominantly African-American. And um, so I was in a majority as well. Went to Reigns High School from 76 to 79, uh, graduated with honors in 1979, all in the majority still. It was a handful of white students who went there, but we were in the majority. So I never experienced any kind of real overt racism, prejudice or discrimination with the exception of that uh, experience I had in the uh, third grade, which I'm gonna come back to because that kind of laid the foundation for the rest of my life, albeit I didn't know it until I was being interviewed by a reporter for a story last year and it all came back to me. So I went from uh, Reigns in 1979 to the University of Florida 
Um, and that's when I became a minority. I never knew what a minority was until I really went to the University of Florida. 33,000 students back then in 1979. And I came out of high school one Friday or Thursday and I was in college the next weekend. And it was a total culture shock for me. I was uh, used to being you know, in the know, president of this, leader of that. All of a sudden I became nobody uh, overnight. And I started experiencing immediately some direct racism, prejudice, and discrimination um, at the University of Florida. And I didn't know whether or not I could, you know, hang there until my first set of grades came out. And once my first set of grades came out in the summer of 79, I knew that I could hang with those students. And, you know, the rest is history. I did graduate on time in, in 1983 with a bachelor's in political science. I was accepted at Howard University. Florida State University and the University of Florida, which I started, I really wanted to go to Howard, but I couldn't afford it. And they were not going to give you a scholarship until your second year. So they were going to make you prove to them that you could make it. Well, by that time, I'd have been $30,000 in debt. So I went to FSU on a scholarship, on a tuition waiver and a stipend. But after I started there about two days, the University of Florida offered me a full Virgil Hawkins scholarship to go to the University of Florida College of Law free of charge. So I wound up breaking my lease in Tallahassee and went back to the University of Florida and finished law school in a year, in, in uh, two and a half years. My class was the first class to receive the Virgil Hawkins Fellowship, which was a three-year full-ride scholarship for African-American students. No one else was qualified for that. And they did that in honor of Virgil Hawkins, who integrated the state university system. A lot of people don't know that, but he, he applied, got accepted, showed up black, and they told you, you cannot go here because you're African-American. Well, before he applied, there were no race, there was no race bar on the application. You just knew not to apply. So he applied, met all their qualifications, but when he showed up African-American, they wouldn't let him sit. He filed a lawsuit. It, it went for almost a decade or so. He ultimately won that uh, lawsuit, but they gave him uh, money to go to another school out of state. And uh, what they did was they gave a scholarship to 15, I think, African-Americans at FSU and 15, no, uh, five or 15 at each school. And I was one of those to get it. And by virtue of the fact that I graduated a half a year earlier than my class, I am technically and historically the first African-American to graduate as a Virgil Hawkins fellow from the University of Florida uh, College of Law. A good friend of mine, he's, he's a lawyer here in town from Pensacola. He's the first one to graduate with that from FSU. So we're the first in the state of Florida. Came back to Jacksonville as a public defender for 18 months, went into private practice from there. I wanna go back to the third, the second grade because something very, very uh, significant happened to me. And one of the things that I wanna to discuss tonight is racism, prejudice, and discrimination. We know about overt racism, we know about that, but a lot of people don't understand about um, implicit bias. And, and Harvard has a good test, it's called, it's an implicit bias test, it's a real good test, I recommend that anybody take it. Because what happens is most racism, prejudice, and discrimination that I've experienced was not overt, it was, it was, it was in a way that the person who did it was not even aware of sometimes of what they're doing. Now, I'm not making an excuse for racist people, but what I'm telling you is that there are a lot of people who don't even know that they're racist. Now, I know that might sound kind of odd, but let me give you some just basic examples before I get to that third grade teacher. Even today, I can go to when Dixie dressed like this after work or whatever before work, and I can see two or three white people ahead of me. OK, the clerk who let's say it's a white clerk or cashier, they'll speak to two or three white people in front of me like, hey, how you doing? How's your day? How's everything going? When I come up, it's hot. That's it. That's it. That's all I get. But I'll sometime I'll wait and count my change. And the next person behind me, let's say they're, Af they're, they're white, it, it starts all over. Hey, how you doing? How's everything going? That person had no concept that they treated me differently than anybody else. So what I'm trying to tell you is if I ask that person, if you ask them, did you, did you treat all your customers the same today? They'll say, yes, they did. They really cognitively believe that they did, but they didn't. So if you show them a video, they're shocked that they, if you show them that video, 
sometimes they'll cry because they don't un they didn't understand what they did until you showed it to them. Now, there's a word for that, a phrase is called cognitive dissonance, cognitive dissonance. And what it is, is anytime our minds come upon information that conflicts with our natural cultural tendencies, we tend to fight the information. Before I go to the third grade again, let me tell you what happens, what was happening to me in the courthouse when I became a lawyer. I would sometimes the judges would have chambers, which means you go in and talk to the judge before court starts and you tell the judge what you're going to do before you do it. So all the lawyers are going in to chambers and the bailiff has to let us in. Let's say two or three or four white lawyers walk in before me. All of us are dressed the same with suits on and briefcases. He's letting one white lawyer go in, two white lawyers go in. But when I walk up, he's like, wait a minute, where are you going? I'm like, uh, I'm going to chambers. Uh, your, your case can be called later by your attorney. I'm like, no, I'm the attorney. I have a client outside. And the, law, and the bailiff will apologize. Not, In other words, he saw a black man. That's all he saw. He didn't see my tie. He didn't see my suit. He didn't see my briefcase. All he saw was a black man. And he was not accustomed to seeing black attorneys. And so he stopped. His first thought was to stop me because he thought I was the defendant or a client in the wrong place. In other words, his first mindset was not that I was a lawyer, even though I was dressed like one. That's cognitive dissonance. Now, once he learned that I was a lawyer, was a lawyer, he apologized to me. But the point is, his first mindset was that I was not a lawyer. That's the problem that we have in society. Now, let me go back to the third grade teacher because that that really uh, it really laid a uh, foundation for my life that I didn't really even understand. What happened was um, the teachers would line you up to take you to lunch. And then when lunch was over, they would line you up and walk you back to class. Well, what we would do, just, you know, little bad children, the teacher would be leading us like a mother duck. And while we're behind her, we would jump out of the line like pistons. One would jump out this way, one like little pistons, you know. And my timing got off one time. So I jumped out of the line. Just as I jumped out, she turned around and saw me. So she stopped the line. Well, I know I'm in trouble. That's not even an issue. So I jumped back in line. I'm thinking I'm just going to get some, you know, reasonable punishment. That white female took her hand, slapped me as hard as she could. I hit the ground. Her whole, her phalange prints were in my face. And then she kicked me. Now I'm in the second grade. Now here's the problem with that. Number one, did I do something wrong? Yes. Number two, should I have been punished? Yes. That's not even an issue. The issue was I got excessively punished and you cannot tell me she would have slapped a white kid like that. No. Now some issue was happening with her life. Who knows? She might've been going through divorce or whatever the case may be. I don't know what the issue was, but she took it out on me. She had no mercy on me whatsoever. And so that gets to what happens a lot of times in society. In society, what happens a lot of times is there is no break given to an African-American or any minority with whom the perpetrator cannot readily identify. That's how most prejudice, racism, and discrimination happen. It happens with the lack of the benefit or a blessing or a break being equitably distributed or dispensed to a person who doesn't look like you or with whom you cannot identify. In other words, what the most racism, prejudice, and discrimination I've experienced in my life, although some of it is overt, and I'll share that with you as well, most of it was, was subconscious from the perspective that this person treated me differently, but may not have actively known that they were. Now, I'm not making any excuse because here's the reason why, because the results are the same. The results are absolutely no different. If a person mistreats you ignorantly, not understanding that they're mistreating you, the results are the same. They're just the same as a person who's racist, prejudiced and discriminatory, a member of the AKA, the results are the same. You can have a racist judge on the bench who hates African-Americans and gives not one of them a break. Or you can have a person on the bench who is ignorant of their own cognitive dissonance and they will sentence the person the same as the racist person on the bench. The results are absolutely no different. The difference is one can be educated to understand what they're doing is not right. Whereas the other one doesn't care. I don't care how much education you give them. 
it's only going to take a heart conversion. That's salvation or something like that. A radical conversion and belief in the Bible can save them. That's it. But the average person who doesn't understand what they're doing, they can be helped. Now, let me give you some instances of some direct racism, prejudice, and discrimination. I remember one time I was riding my motorcycle from Fraternity Row at the University of Florida. And some, some guys, I was on Fraternity Row, so all the frat houses are on this uh, street. And I was riding my bicycle, I mean, motorcycle, 750 Suzuki around the curb, probably doing about 20 miles an hour, okay, because that's what the speed limit is on campus. And some drunk white boys came out and tried to pull me off that motorcycle at 20 miles an hour. It just so happened that I didn't fall. Another uh, race, racist situation I have had happened to me at the University of, uh, of Florida was um, I, uh, I went out with some, some friends of mine who happened to be white. And we, we go out, we're having a good time and everything. And um, I didn't notice it until something happened. I was only African-American in that whole establishment. I didn't realize it until we were walking out and somebody said, let's kill that nigger. And I'm like, who's the nigger they trying to kill? I looked around, it was me. In other words, I was oblivious to the fact that never happened to me again after that. I was oblivious to the fact that I was the only African-American in that establishment. And what had happened was I had let my car down because when you're raised on the north side of Jacksonville, you understand quite well you cannot let your anywhere you go ever. I remember when we were kids, children, and we would get we would be going downtown with my parents, and here's this lecture all the way downtown. Listen, when we get downtown, do not raise your voice. Do not look people in the eye. Do not do all of these don'ts, don'ts, don'ts. Well, it was because they knew good and well. If an African-American child did something, a child did something, they would wind up, they could wind up getting killed or going to jail just for an African-American kid talking out of line or looking at, at a white person the wrong way or whatever the case may be. And so we would get those lectures all the time. The problem today is that people don't understand that there's still active racism, prejudice, and discrimination going on. And I would say it's worse now than it was before because a lot of people think that we've arrived and we really haven't. I remember one example that happened in law school. Um, our law school exams were like four hours. So when you come in, you know, you, you're gonna be sent down there for at least, even if you're good, you're at least three and a half hours, okay? It was a white kid in my class who would always brag about his father and how much money he made an hour. And it was a lot of money back then when he was talking about his father. This is like 1983. 83, 84, 85. He was telling us what his daddy was making. His daddy was a bull gator, which is, you know, they donate to millions of dollars to the University of Florida. This kid, we would be in exams. After 30 minutes, he'd get up and walk out. And everybody would look like, where is he going? He walked out. He never came back. You know why? Because his daddy was giving money to the school. We all knew it. And he was so prideful and arrogant and ignorant that he wouldn't even sit down and act. In other words, the professors were helping. He wouldn't even sit down for four hours and play the game. He got up after 30 minutes and walked out and he graduated, you know, on time. I graduated early, but he graduated on time. Here's another scenario I remember happening. I remember I was studying one, one, uh, one Friday, I believe, and I was walking out the library and I heard one of my professors hollering across the breezeway to a student who was in my class and he called his name he said hey so and so so tennis nine o'clock in the morning i'm thinking to myself okay this is my law professor playing tennis with one of my classmates so i started watching the classmate from the, from then on sure enough the professor was taking care of him i'm quite sure they had some relationship or whatever parents i don't know what they came a lot of those kids i went to school with their parents went there Mothers went there, fathers went there, grandparents went there. I'm the first generation of family to go to college, so I didn't have those connections. But, you know, there were other ways to, to get around that system. I remember I wanted to, um, and let me just say this right here. I'm going to give you some positive things about racism, prejudice, and discrimination. But before I get there, I'm going to tell you what happened with a, with a white professor. They brought a white professor. He was an exchange professor from South Africa. They brought him in to teach one of our political science classes. And so it, it blew me away what happened because I saw, I saw reverse racism against white people with him. And this is what happened. He had given us a tough assignment and he gave us a timeline and uh, one of the kids didn't meet it. One of the white kids didn't meet it. 
And uh, he got on him right in front of the class. He said, listen, you will get this right next time or you will flunk this class. And so the kids are, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I remember this like it was yesterday. The kid said, I'm going to do it. It's going to be right. And the professor said, it had better be in his accent. I remember that. I locked it in my mind. He said, it had better be. Because I wanted to see if he was going to hold that white student to it. And he did. Not only did he hold that white student to it, but he was harder on all the white students. I had never seen anything like that in my life. He was treat, treating white students like I was used to white teachers treating black students, but he would treat us with deference. And I could tell, I said, you know what? He has seen some real racism, prejudice and discrimination in South Africa. And he knows about the existence of it in America. And he wasn't playing the radio. I, you know, I felt sorry for some of my white students because that man, he was hard on them, but he was light on us. I mean, he gave us deference. So I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if white people feel sorry for us when they feel, when they see us being discriminated against by white people. Because I felt sorry for those people, but I could identify with what they were suffering from because I had suffered from it. But let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you never suffered through any of the things that I'm talking about, I'm, I'm probably speaking French to you and you speak English, okay? A lot of people who have not suffered through these things cannot readily identify with these problems. And it, it permeates, it is from the cradle, like I said, to the casket. It is baked into the American psyche and most people don't understand. Let me, let me give you some positive things about racism, prejudice and discrimination from an African-American's perspective. I try to be very, very cognizant or aware of, of what's going on. So when I first got back here from law school, I noticed that you know white white lawyers didn't really respect me. They didn't. They they presumed that I was, I guess, dumb or ignorant until you know I developed a reputation for trying cases. But once I developed that reputation, it was too late for them because I had already beat them. And let me tell you what I would do. I would never let if I if I could avoid it. I would never tell an opponent that I went to the University of Florida. I would never tell them that I went to the University of Florida College of Law. I would never tell them that I went on a scholarship. I would never tell them that I graduated early. I would never tell them I was in this, I was in that, I was president of this. I was president of my, I was vice president of the law student body at the University of Florida. And I'm gonna tell you how I won it because it was only about 45 African-Americans up against about 2,500 students. And I had to campaign to white students to win. But what I did was I campaigned to the seniors and I basically told them, I said, look, we know you guys are going out and doing some great things and making money and everything else. I'm, we know you don't care about what's going on, but somebody like me, we care. So I went to the seniors and I had a white female who just knew she was gonna win, didn't campaign hard, just kind of, lackadaisically handle her election, assuming she was going to win, I killed her and became vice president of the law student body at the University of Florida. Got, got more votes than her on all fronts. Definitely got a block of African-Americans, but that wasn't enough for, to win it for me. But let me tell you what, what, what I did was I used people's prejudice against them. I would never tell a, a, a white opponent how smart I was. I, I, I wouldn't want them to think I was smart. You know why? Because what I found was I would let their ignorance work against them. What I found was they did, when they thought I was ignorant or whatever, when they played the stereotype, they didn't prepare like I was preparing. I'm over preparing and they're under preparing. They're assuming that they're just going to mop the floor with me. And ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen my opponents. You know, we've won the case. The jury has come back and I'm looking at them and they're sitting down at the conference at the counsel's table looking down and I know what that look is that look is what in the world just happened let me tell you what happened to you what happened to you was you assumed that I was dumb you assumed that I was ignorant you assumed that I went to some rinky dink college you was but after it's all over it's too late it's way too late for that so what I'm telling you is there are some positive sides to people being racist towards you and prejudicial towards you. If you let them think what they want to think. See, by the time you get in a trial, baby, it's too late. You know, and I'm standing up, you know, doing the closing argument, talking for an hour with no notes because I know it. And my, my opponent is over there write, writing notes. No, my closing argument is in my heart. It's in my mind. I've lived this case 
for six months. I know it like the back of my hand. And so when you come to me with some crazy stuff, I got a counter argument for it immediately because I've lived this case. I understand this case, but to them, it's just another piece of paper that they're shuffling and a file or whatever. And they assume that the opponent who was African-American, it, it took about maybe, maybe about five years. After five years, nobody took me uh, for granted anymore. Matter of fact, I heard that um, in the state attorney office that um, they would put two lawyers on me. So I would always try cases against two lawyers. Still win the case. I'm trying to case against two lawyers. A, 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 an investigator, a detective, and the arresting officer, and a paralegal. And we still win the case because we are overprepared. Um, some of the best things that ever happened to me in my life long term were when I was mistreated by other people. I'm going to tell you why. Because even that scenario with that teacher, I wanted to hurt that lady at, 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 at whatever age I was, but I couldn't. There was nothing I could do to her. I couldn't do anything to her, okay? That's when I first heard about the NAACP because they called it end up my mother. When I went home, these fingerprints were in my phalange, prints were in my face, marks in my face. They called the NAACP and the NAACP, excuse me, president went up to the school the next day. And I remember this, like it was yesterday. They called me in the principal's office and asked me what happened. I told them. And then they called each one of my classmates in individually and asked every one of them, what happened and all of my classmates said the same thing. And the only thing they did for that lady was transfer her to another school. That's all they did for her in the sixties. Now that wouldn't happen like that today. It wouldn't, she would have a more of a consequence. My parents didn't even sue the school system for that back then. That's how, you know, you just didn't do anything like that back in the sixties, they were too afraid to do it. But um, those are the kind of things, you know, that happened uh, back then. But some of those things like that scenario right there, uh, it burned in me. A, a, a will to want to right wrongs. I didn't realize that until I was going over my life with a reporter last year and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm partners with two guys in a software company. The software company is called Technologies for Justice. And what we do is we've been blessed by God to create some software. And what that software can do is go through 2 million records in seconds and pull up apple to apple and orange to orange comparisons so that judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys, public and private, can see what former sentences have been handed down so that they can now issue sentences that are consistent with those that have been handed down in the past. It's called equity and sentencing analysis system. And um, it's technologiesforjustice.com is the website. Technologiesforjustice.com is the website. The other area that I'm heavily involved in right now is trying to secure housing for homeless people. Now, the greatest common denominator for racism, prejudice, discrimination, and just um, uh, lack of helping people is, is uh, economics. Um, that's the greatest common denominator. I see a lot of poor whites being discriminated against just as badly as poor, uh, poor and rich African-Americans, as a matter of fact, um, in the system. And so the, mo the, the greatest common denominator is economics. African-Americans who are well off and can afford to hire top-notch attorneys do quite well. However, poor whites who cannot hire top-notch lawyers, top-notch lawyers, excuse me, they don't do well as well as uh, whites who can. However, the average white defendant will do better than the average black defendant when both of them have public defenders. I can't explain to you why, but I've seen case after case after case whereby the situations and circumstances are the same, same charges, same uh, history, but the sentences are diametrically opposite. One person getting seven years, another person getting 15 years, yet the cases are the same. And so a lot of times it's because of that cognitive dissonance that I talked about earlier. And so um, I'm working with Housing for the Homeless and that website is housingforthehomeless.com, housingforthehomeless.com. Been trying to work with our city government uh, to get them to change the law on their own. They wouldn't do it. So now we got a petition drive going. We got to get 30,000 uh, signatures together by the end of November to change the law. Our city gives away millions of dollars to, to the rich who don't need it to renovate downtown buildings, okay? The same buildings where they don't want any homeless people around. Well, I have a proposal that if it passes, 
it'll require the city to set aside 5% of the millions of dollars that they give out to the wealthy to renovate downtown. And what we have is a corporate welfare system that helps the rich. The downtown development, downtown investment authority evaluates proposals. And sometimes the, the evaluator would say that, that the, the company can afford to build the project on their own. We shouldn't give them any money. They'll veto that person and give them the money anyway. Last year alone, the city of Jacksonville gave away a half a billion dollars in grants and forgivable loans, okay, and some loans that are not forgivable to the wealthy. All I'm saying is if we set aside five cents on every dollar that they're giving away in grants and forgivable loans to the wealthy, they just set aside 5% of that, your and my homeless problem will be resolved because that more than enough to pay for permanent housing for the homeless, irrespective of whether you're a man or woman, black or white. And with that, I've been talking about 30 minutes and I'm gonna open it up and uh, allow you all to take it from there. I think we might have a Q and A session. Thank you all. Uh, any questions? Yes, we have mixed results so far, but let me, before I answer that question directly, I'm gonna answer it indirectly. Here, here's what you have. This is, this is so revolutionary that it's hard for people to wrap their minds around it, <laughs> okay? So it's, it, is, it is fundamentally changing the way we have done criminal work forever. And so since it's so new, you know, anything that's new, especially when it's technologically inclined, it's a slow process. So there's mixed results. But in my opinion, it's, it's right on the right trajectory and schedule for it. I know some of my business partners think it's too slow. I don't think it's too slow. I think it's gonna just slowly permeate society. So we have several public defender offices using it right now and, um, and a lot of private attorneys. And I do help private attorneys all over the state. You can buy a subscription and use it yourself. We'll train you up on how to use it yourself so you can do your own searches. But what most lawyers do is they'll hire me to run the searches for them. And then some of them will hire me as an expert to testify in court. So I write uh, expert witness reports. So we do have offices using it throughout the state and a lot of private attorneys using it, but we, we have something working that I'm not at liberty to discuss right now that um, we're working on. And it's very promising that a prosecutor's office and a public defender's office is trying to come in and use it um, together which is, that's revolutionary. I'm, that's a cat and a dog sitting down having a, having dinner together, you know what I mean? But they, both of them understand the significance of it. From the prosecutor's side, if you can look at data and look at the average sentences that have been uh, handed out, let's say for burglary charge in the past, you can formulate now reasonable offers in the present and the future that's based upon prior case uh, dispositions, which we call that case law precedent, case precedent. We do it in the law in terms of legal research and writing in the cases, but we have not done it with respect to sentences. So that's what ESAS does. And so it's very promising and you're gonna hear more about it as more, um, and, and also I'm working with some judges right now, which is very important. So if the judges embrace it, it'll kind of start snowballing, but I would give it like within the next five to seven years or so, I think everybody will be using it. But on, in, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's right on the right trajectory because anytime you want to bring something that's different, you know, it's going to be a slow process for people to use it. Amen. Usually, no, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> no. See, because what happens is appeals are normally directed towards whether or not a mistake was made at trial. Okay. There are some that can take place whether a mistake was made at sentencing. Okay. But usually, um, those appeals do not really work because the system is not geared towards appellate cases towards sentences that are excessive. 
um, the 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 uh, equal protection clause protects people from excessive sentences. The problem is there's been no objective means by which to prove that a sentence was excessive until this software. And so this software just came on, online in 2018, okay? And watch this. The first case it was used on, the person was facing a, a white male who was 20 years old, turned 21 the day after his sentencing, was facing 10 years minimum to 150 years maximum because he had uh, five, no, 10 counts of five, 15 year felonies. So it's 10 times 15, 150 years. So his minimum sentence was 10 years, his maximum was 150. Well, when they used the data from our system, the, the state attorney, I mean, the public defender offered uh, two years. They had a hearing and she presented the data to the judge. The judge sentenced the, the young man to two years as a youth in a youth camp, two years of community control, that's home detention, and two years of probation. So he had a six year sentence that was split by two years incarceration in the youth camp, two years home detention, and two years <laughs> probation. That went down from a minimum of 10 to a maximum of 150 years. You know why? Because the judge was able to see that that same court had issued other people probationary sentences for, for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 counts. This guy only had 15 counts. So that's the power of this system that we have. Any other questions? Hold yes. on, let me answer that one first, okay? Yes, that one. That's a good question. Here, here it is. We all have free will. God gives us free will. There are many people. I've met, I know a, a veteran that I serve, you know. Um, he's been homeless for 15 years, and he likes being homeless. Those people are minorities. That's in the minority, okay? The vast majority of people that I serve and I work with, okay, I'm a minister as well, so I preach to them on Sunday mornings outside in the hot sun, Okay. And, you know, give them clothing, food and tents and all that stuff. The vast majority of them were not homeless within the last two or three years. They're homeless now because of the economy and COVID-19 and everything else. The vast majority of those people want housing. OK, but what I do run into a lot is the things that you just say. And what I what I find, I was talking to a councilman who said, well, some of those people want to be homeless. Yes, sir. But it's only a very microscopic few. So please, ma'am and sirs, don't get it twisted. There are a few who want to be homeless, but there are some of us out here who drink too much. We waste our money. We gamble it away. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of us out here are not exercising our free will properly either. It's just that we're not homeless, but we're just as irresponsible as some of them. So my focus is on the ones who want home, want housing, permanent housing, okay? And I want to help them. If the others want to exercise their free will to maintain their homelessness, they have the right to do that. But I'm not going to believe that the vast majority of people want to be homeless just because of an unfaithful few. Okay, what's your second question? Um, and I get that question a lot as well. I, I get a lot of questions like that. So thank you for it. It, it, because, it give, because it gives me an opportunity to answer because it's a legitimate question. Here's the reality of what's going on. I can only do what I can do, okay? That's not my job to get them jobs. What they need right now is housing. I gave a guy a tent last, let me just give you an example. I'm talking about. I gave a guy a tent last February of last year. I ran into him in the summer. He sees me. I hadn't seen him since I gave him a tent. He starts crying. He said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, I don't. He said, you gave me a tent in, in February and it changed my life. I said, a tent changed your life? How did it do that? He said, because when you gave me that tent, I had somewhere to put my clothes to keep them dry. I was able to go and interview for a job. I got the job, okay? I got an apartment. I got a car. He pointed to the car. It was a used car. He bought it and everything. But he said, the tent is what situated him to be in a position to be comfortable enough to go get a job. So my responsibility that I'm taking upon myself is to try to facilitate them getting housing. Now, I work with Sosbacher. I work with uh, Changing Homelessness. And I'm working with anybody else. But my, that's not my lane. My lane is to get them housing. And then they have a multiplicity of services through Sosbacher and Changing Homelessness 
and Trinity Rescue Mission, City Rescue Mission, that they can get them off drugs and everything else. That's not my lane. That's not my lane. My lane is to help them get housing. Once they, by the way, a lot of them have social security. I've helped one man get his social security check cut back on. He was without it for six months. He lives in a shelter right now. He gets over $600 a month in social security, but guess what? That's not enough for an apartment now because the rents are so high. So a lot of these people have income, but it's not enough to get them housing. So I'm trying to get them housing that's paid for by the city. I know people don't like that. Here's what the mayor, I'm, I'm meeting with a councilman and somebody from the mayor's office last summer. I'm meeting with a councilman. I thank God for him. He set a meeting up for me to talk to somebody in the mayor's office, somebody in finance about this idea. So I'm talking to them. And somebody from the mayor's office asked me this loaded question. They said, well, Pastor Barlow, um, what do you think the city's responsibility should be towards giving housing to homeless people? Now, what she was really saying is, should the city be in the business of corporate, of, of uh, welfare, giving houses to the homeless? Here's the answer to that question. No, the city should not be in the business of giving welfare to homeless people for them to have housing. But let me show the hypocrisy of it. The city should not also be in the business of giving millionaires money to renovate downtown. Yet you have no problem with that, none. You have no problem with giving a half a billion dollars to rich people, even when the people say they shouldn't get the money. You give it to them anyway, and grants and forgivable. Well, my answer to her is, as long as you give money to millionaires, you should be able to give money to the to, to uh, homeless people. Because I call it what it is. It's corporate welfare. That's what it is. So what I want to do is tie a law to that. As long as they give money to millionaires, let 5% of that money go towards housing for the homeless. If you don't want to give housing to the homeless, stop giving it to millionaires and I'll leave you alone. That's how I answer those questions. But thank you for that. Um, for those very inf uh, insightful questions. I appreciate it. Anybody else got some questions? I, I have a few, yes. a few statements if I could, just real quick, because this surely is not my show. And thank you so much for, your, for the information. But I would like to present this to the group. I'm an educated woman, um, historically black colleges, undergrad and grad. I sustained a severe stomach injury. In that process, I lost my home. I was homeless, <clears throat> excuse me for that. Um, when I sought shelter, they told me that I couldn't get it because in order to get the emergency shelter, I had to be coming from a domestic violence situation. I wasn't. I had to be on drugs. I wasn't. I had to be a woman with children. I'm single. I don't have any children. I had to fit all these parameters that I didn't fit. Yet I couldn't work and I lost my home. I was homeless. There was a facility in my neighborhood that they wanted me to go to. I refused to go in it. You know why? Because they had a sit, they would have a sit in chairs and in the evening they close out the lights. The men saw me coming and said, yeah, we want you to come in here. So I didn't go. But people on the outside felt like, well, you should go in there if you're homeless. Go in there and get what? Raped, hurt, harmed? So all the stigma and the biases that were a part of that system kept me homeless and unsheltered. And thank goodness I had friends who eventually uh, I went to stay with, but I was still homeless. So I'm presenting this to the group. When people are out there walking down the street, homeless, and maybe even crying, it's not just because they want to be there. Our circumstances put us there. And that's all I wanted to say. And, and that's so, I'm glad you said that because, I mean, you, listen, I minister to these people. I know them by name. I, I help some of the veterans get connected with the um, programs and everything. And see, here's it's a vicious cycle. There's I, there's one lady I call her Miss Betty. I met her uh, last year. She was sleeping on the sidewalk. This lady is in her 80s, 80s, white lady. She, she could be my grandmother. I'm like, what are you doing out here? She told me that she had been live, renting a home from somebody, I think in Springfield or whatever, for years, decades maybe, at a low cost. The owner sold the house to someone else. OK, they immediately went up on her rent. I can't remember what she told me it was. She couldn't afford it. They kicked that lady out. That lady was sleeping on the sidewalk. 80 something year old white female sleeping on the sidewalk at Jefferson and you. And I bought her a tent and I gave her some gift cards for Harvard's grocery store down the street. 
but that lady was sleeping outside. And when I started making a bunch of noise about what was going on up there, you know, the, the city came in and they took a lot of them out um, from, we call it the camp on the corner of Jefferson and Union. But what they did was the city very uh, clandestinely took them away and gave them temporary accommodations, you know, at a facility around the corner. And then they put them in um, hotels for about six months or whatever. When that money ran out, all, just about all those people were homeless again. But what they want to do is clean off, clean up that area because it was receiving a lot of negative publicity. But there are a lot of people out there. They were not on drugs before they became homeless. Now, some of them get introduced to drugs to try to cope with homelessness because they've never been homeless before. And they don't know how to deal with it. So then they get in a vicious cycle. Yeah, some of them were on drugs before they became homeless, but a lot of them were not. They were just like you and me. And here's what I ask people. How do you feel in your heart when you see a homeless person? Can you empathize with them? Or do you just like Bruce Holmes being the range song says, uh, go get a job? Because see, if you cannot have any compassion on those people, it's something wrong with you. It's something wrong with you. Because guess what? It's only but by the grace of God that we're not homeless. I was talking to a lady just three days ago. She said she used to look down on homeless people until guess what? She became homeless. And now she helps me help homeless people because she's coming out of homelessness now and she understands it. So sometimes God will providentially allow us to fall into the same negative situations and circumstances that we cannot with which we cannot empathize to get some compassion in us. Is there another question? You're correct. You're absolutely yeah. correct. I think I'm glad I'm glad that you opened up because that reminds me of this. Um, I did an interview with one of the new, I think Action News Jacks. It's on the website. If you go to housing for the homeless campaign.com, it's it's a it's an interview that I did with a, a television station here, a news station. And you know how reporters do, they'll go behind you and ask somebody else. I'm not an expert in that area at all, you know, homelessness. I'm learning about it, but they asked an expert about my idea, I guess thinking that she was going to disagree with me. And this is what the expert said. And your statement reminded me, the expert told the reporter, listen, it's less expensive to get them permanent housing for the very same reasons you just articulated so well. <laughs> and so he was shocked that she agreed with me, but it's, it's correct. Now, I'll say this, I won't name the person, but there is another expert in this area who I consult with in homelessness. They've been in it, it's their career. So I asked this person, and this is what they told me, and this is sad, but it's true. They said, Pastor Barlow, the city is not gonna, city officials are not, listen to this now. I'm being trained, schooled on this, how to present this stuff. They said, city officials will not listen to your compassionate pleas that it's the right thing to do, the moral thing to do to get these people houses for the homeless. They won't listen to that, but let me tell you what they'll listen to. If you go in there and tell them that it's going to be cost, it's going to be less expensive for the city to give them permanent housing than it would to keep them in shelters, okay, which shelters are very expensive, very expensive. You got the salaries, you got the food, you got the insurance and everything else, okay. Now, shelters have a place to, to, uh, to work. They should be there, but for emergency situations only. But that's not what's happening now. They're permanently housing homeless people in shelters, which means the people who temporarily need housing for emergency situations can't get it because they're already over, they have over capacity. So what, she, what this person told me was, if you go down there and make economic arguments to them, it'll work. So I put it to the test. I'm talking to an official one day, a week or so after this, and I'm telling them about, you know, the homeless and the problems, and everything. They were just giving me a, a, a deaf ear until I said this. I said, you know what? If you, if you provide them housing, you know, away from downtown, away from the businesses that you're building up and everything, you know, it'll help the business owners and they'll like it. All of a sudden, the person started paying attention to what I was saying. That's sad, but that's true. So with a certain group of people, I highlight the morality issues. With other, with other groups of people, especially hard-headed politicians who are only concerned about the dollars, I come from a different perspective, but I bring it all together as, as much as I can because I'm also 
a minister and I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay. If you can have, if you can harbor hatred in your heart, any human being, but especially one that's poor and destitute and, and, and hurting, you got a problem. Your problem is you got an eternal problem. You might not get into heaven like that. You might have all the money on earth that you want. You might have all the nice cars, houses, boats, motorcycles, 401k, plan, full and fat. But guess what? If you don't have any compassion in your heart towards your fellow man, you are just as homeless spiritually as a physically homeless person on earth right now. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? I have a comment, Attorney Barlow. Just want to let you know, I like what you're doing and I'm so much in your corner because we do need to provide housing for the homeless so we can get the people up off the street so that they can have a chance, an opportunity to go forward and to do better. Like you said, a lot of people are homeless because of their financial situation. A lot of them do not want to be homeless, no, but because don't. of financial situation, a financial hardship, that is what happened to them. So kudos to you, you know, that, you know, if you can get housing, affordable housing for these people, we need more of that. And downtown would be a perfect location. Like you say, a lot of abandoned buildings, they could be utilized. So thank you so much for what you're doing and keep up the good work. And thank you for thanking me. But let me say this right here, because I, I get real uh, with people. You know, um, this is not about me at all. I'm so far afield and what I was trained to do and what I thought I was going to be doing in life is not even funny. But here's the reality of it. I have a certain skill set that can be used to to kind of kick the darky in the butt to get something done. I mean, I'm a mover and a shaker. I know they've been doing it all my life. So I'm not going to cow down. I'm not going to cower down and not do it for these people. But here's the reality of it. This is not a city government problem to solve. It's really a societal problem to solve. It's really a church problem to solve, to be frank with you. But I'm leaning on the government because the government is giving our tax money to rich people who don't need. So what people, are, what you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is it's a fixed fight going on downtown. People are not playing fair. They'll say on TV, yeah, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No, sir, you don't mean that because you're getting corporate welfare. Now, don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen. If I were a billionaire and I got $40 billion in the bank and it's going to cost me $15, $20 million for a project, but the city is going to give me half of it, don't you know I'm going to take that half? Yeah, I'm going to take it. I'm not stupid. So they can build these buildings and renovate them without city finances. But they have created what's called the Downtown Investment Authority. It is a corporate welfare machine. That's what it is. So I call it what it is. I, I have a degree in political science. I know it like the back of my hand. I have a law degree. I know that like the back of my hand. That's why I drafted that petition. I know what they're doing. They're taking your and my tax dollars and giving it to the wealthy and then turn right back around and saying they're pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. No, you're not. You're using my tax money to do it. And when I come to you and tell you, you need to give a small percent of pauper share to build housing for the homes. You got the audacity to ask me what I think the city's responsibility should be towards homelessness, it should be the same thing as it is towards corporate welfare recipients. They should not get anything. But if you want to give them that money, then you need to be setting aside 5%. Now, the city needs to do that on their own. I shouldn't even have to waste my time getting petitions going around. I, I'm having to leave my law office and everything else, go around getting petitions to sign. And here's the other thing. A lot of people don't even support it. Yeah, they'll tell me thank you and good, pat me on the back and all that. Listen, that won't help them get in the house. They, we need campaign donations. We need petitions signed and everything else. Yeah, and one of the things about social media is it's got people confused. People think that if they get on social media and say amen, glory to God and hallelujah to an issue, they supported it. No, it takes shoe leather to do that. It takes money to do that. It takes volunteers to do stuff like that. So I appreciate all of the thanks that me and everything else, but that won't do it. We need help to help these people. Amen. So I'd appreciate any kind of help you can do. How can we help you? Okay. Well, actually, how can you help me help the homeless? Go yes. to the website, housing for the homeless campaign. Dot com. I asked them to put it up and just go. It's a petition. You can print out a petition. Now, there's a certain way you have to sign it and everything, you know, but you can print out a petition and everything, sign it, 
and um, you know, get it to me. And and um, you can donate to the campaign. You know, if if you know, uh, ten, uh, I'll just maybe you know, five hundred people give ten dollars. That helps. You know that those small amounts help because we're gonna have, even if we get the petitions, we're gonna have to do a campaign to put it on television because you know what's gonna happen. The people who don't want this to happen, they're gonna run a hundred thousand dollar media campaign. Flipping the script, telling you why you shouldn't vote on something like this when all of us know we should. So go to the website and uh, you can do a donations through that website. You can comment through that website. You can sign up as a volunteer through that website and everything else and learn more about, about the issues. But ladies and gentlemen, let me say this right here before we get off here. We are in so much trouble that people do not understand. All you have to do is do a Google search and look at homelessness in America, you'll see some chronic homelessness across the nation that is overtaking cities and they don't know what to do. Well, this measure here will save us. There's nothing like this across the United States of America. No, no one else has done anything like this. And it's probably because the rich don't want them to do it. Amen. And that other website about the sentencing is technologiesforjustice.com. All right, well, thank you everyone and uh, have a great evening and great rest of the week. And uh, again, thank you, Attorney Barlow. Thank you.